We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all, all united. united. Good evening, good afternoon, uh, good morning, uh, wherever you are, the listeners to our panel are global. This is a global village. This is United Nations framework. You are all over the world, I believe. So for everyone, it's either sunrise or sunset or somewhere in the middle of the night. Wherever you are, we're greeting you from uh, Poland. And we're starting a panel on transatlantic relations and cyber and digital affairs. Um, the economies and the societies of the 21st century will increasingly be based on digital solutions. Uh, the rules of game and then managing the ongoing technological cooperation between Europe and the USA in relation to such issues like uh, cybersecurity, big data, quantum computers, artificial intelligence, telecommunication technologies, seems to be an obvious task. How we can work together between Europe and the USA to promote the development of digital technologies, how we can work together to keep internet open, free, safe and secure for all users all over the world, how we can cooperate to the development of new innovative technologies so they can serve all humankind is an important question. For many decades, Europe and the USA are allies, are friends, they work together, and there is obvious benefits and obvious challenges to this cooperation. Today we will try to discuss some of them in the context of digital and cyber relations between Europe and the USA. And I'm very pleased to have very distinguished guests uh, with us today uh, that I will present in the alphabetical order of the states and then organizations. With, uh, from France, we have uh, Mr. Henri Verdier, ambassador for digital affairs, uh, former entrepreneur, and turned into the serving the state of France, but also the European community. From Germany, we have Dr. Regina Greenberger, cyber ambassador and director for cyber, foreign and security policy at the uh, German Foreign Office. From the Netherlands, we have Ms. Natalie Jarschma, ambassador at large for security policy and cyber at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. From Poland online, not with us here in Katowice, we have Mr. Krzysztof Bednarek, Deputy Director from EU Economics Department, from the Chancellery of the Prime Minister, and uh, from the USA, we have Mr. Stephen Anderson, Deputy Assistant Secretary for Communication and Information Policy, Department of State, who is also supported by Ms. Liesel Franz, Deputy Coordinator for Cyber Issues, also from the Department of State. And last but not least, we have a distinguished representative of the European Commission, Director Pierce O'Donoghue, Director of Future Networks at DG Connect. And myself, I'm Tadeusz Chomitsky, I'm Ambassador for Cyber and Tech Affairs from the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Poland, and I have a pleasure and a challenge to moderate this panel today. So, my first question to, to the panelists uh, will be concerning the opportunities and the benefits in close and coordinated cooperation in digital and cyber matters between 
Europe and the USA, but also the challenges or even sometimes difference of interests in some areas. Because there is no new industry, there is no new economy development without innovative and digital technologies. There is no new effective digital technologies without effective cybersecurity. There is no more internationalized and transborder as well as more transsectorial security than cybersecurity. No other security, no other aspect or part of security depends on international cooperation. No other security is more transsectorial. You cannot have a safe administration without safe financing or safe civil society without safe infrastructure, critical infrastructure. So this interdependence between sectors translates into interdependence between states and cooperation between states is the precondition of safe uh, 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 cyber uh, cyberspace. And without safe cyberspace, we cannot develop new technologies, new digitalized technologies, which are in hand a condition of the future development of economies and the humankind prosperity. So let's try to discuss what are the opportunities and benefits and what are perhaps challenges to the close cooperation between Europe and the USA. I will start with Natalie Jarsma, the Dutch ambassador, uh, for sharing your views on that question. Natalie. Yeah, so. Thank you very much, uh, Tadeusz and um, dear uh, guests. And I'm, I'm very happy to see uh, people here in the audience and to be here in Katowice in person um, after all these uh, uh, online meetings. Um, I wanted to make some um, first some um, general comments and then some short comments about uh, cyber. So first in, in general, the transatlantic relationship, do you hear me? Yeah, okay. The transatlantic relationship is a very um, comprehensive relationship based on shared values. And for decades, uh, there has been uh, transatlantic cooperation through industry, civil society, sciences, and also government. Through innovation, our societies have been able to reap the benefits of the internet and digitalization. And to us, it is the Netherlands, but I, I think I can speak on behalf of all of us sitting here. It's a no-brainer no that we need to continue and deepen this relationship. Um, Uh, that's that's an interesting uh, <laughs> call. Um, the world um, is uh, different, though, than 10 years ago. And what has changed in the recent years is that in this globalized world, our values are being challenged. And for decades, we were used to looking through an economic lens and a security lens separately. And we have built separate institutions and coordination mechanisms. For the transatlantic security relationship, we have primarily NATO. And for the economic relationship, we focused on creating and preserving level playing fields um, through multilateral me mechanisms and later on more and more through free trade agreements. But now that our values are being challenged, the lines between security and economy become less clear. And that is especially true for digital technologies that connect us all as humankind. So in reaction, we see that every single liberal democracy is doing its own homework to connect these security and economy dots better, aiming for protecting our values while preserving open economies and also keeping promises to the global south. And this requires better coordination and strategic thinking within national administrations, at the EU level, and the transatlantic relationship. And we see this happening. 
Um, Tadeusz, you asked, like, what do you see as the biggest challenge? I think here the biggest challenge is coordination. Since we have all these established institutions and mechanisms, and we need to connect the dots. Um, in the cyber domain, we've actually made big steps. And through the very active engagement by a lot of countries, including the ones represented on this panel, we now have um, international agreement on what is responsible state behavior on ICTs and what not. And this consensus has been reconfirmed by the UN General Assembly this year. So we have a framework that forms a yardstick for responsible state behavior, and we need to hold states accountable if they do not respect that framework through their actions or non-actions. And this also requires coordination on information sharing, on assessments and on possible actions, but also capacity building. We have built up serious mus muscle memory to do so, both within the EU as well as in the transatlantic relationship. And more broadly with states that are of the opinion that the international legal order in cyberspace needs to be strengthened. Impunity of malicious actors is not an option, since this would have enormous security and economic consequences for the entire world. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie. I would like uh, to ask Regina to follow with your views and comments. Thank you, Tadeusz. Um, well, first, I'm, I'm grateful to Natalie because I can start off now where she ended. Uh, for the sake of time, I will not repeat most of the things I'm completely uh, aligning with uh, Natalie. Um, I also see uh, the, the world in a change, a profound change uh, due to the digital transformation. And both uh, the US and Europe are in a similar position because our societies, our economies and our political system and also our defense relies heavily on digital technologies, especially on cyber technologies. And therefore, um, both of us, the US and Europe, uh, have created um, a really an important attack surface also to all the malicious actors that are there outside. And starting with that, we have also uh, developed, uh, um, let's say, uh, we share uh, the threat assessment of where these um, threats to our security come from and uh, what we can do about it. So I would like to focus in my, uh, in my um, uh, remarks um, on the security policy issues. And I would like to mention um, three um, examples for how we align and how our interests and also our actions converge. The first one is um, in the field of attribution and accountability. Within the UN framework we have created with uh, the consensus reports of this spring um, a framework for how to do a responsible attribution of cyber incidents to state actors. And both uh, the US and Europe Europe within the EU cyber diplomacy f uh, toolbox follow uh, this, uh, let's say, this uh, rules of how to attribute cyber incidents to an actor. And we did so um, in the past month um, at least two times together. Uh, the first one, the first case was the solar winds uh, attacks, which we uh, attributed, uh, and um, the f other one was um, Ghostwriter. In the first case, it was more uh, the US that was concerned in Ghostwriter, is what it was more European states that were concerned. But we used this tool of attribution um, in, a, in, the same, um, in the same way. Another example is our, um, our defense um, uh, instruments that we use within NATO, within our military alliance. In the NATO cyber defense review, um, that was uh, completed also this year in summer. Uh, for the first time, we said that also uh, the cumulative effect of s individual cyber incidents can, um, uh, summar uh, can be summarized to something that can trigger Article 5 reactions. This is very important because it shows that we have the same awareness that although an um, individual incident can remain under the threshold of a military kinetic attack, um, 
the sum of several such incidents uh, can uh, sum up to uh, something that can trigger Article 5 and therefore the Alliance to act. And the third example is uh, the counter ransomware initiative. This is an, an American initiative and it tackles the problem of ransomware. We found this really something very um, disturbing um, in, in the last month. The number of ransomware attacks has increased sharply and the sums that has have to be, had to be paid as ransom have also increased incredibly. Ransomware is not only um, a financial crime or financial cybercrime, a cybercrime before financial interests, it also affects national security interests as far as critical infrastructure is concerned. And we have seen this because ransomware attacks have been uh, issued against um, health organizations, against energy supply, um, uh, and so on. So this is really something where we have to do something together and uh, uh, and the US called for uh, a counter ransomware initiative with initially about 30 states, but the group is growing, who try to come together uh, to join their efforts. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Regina. This is um, really important. I just uh, shortly comment that uh, um, I was taking part in a um, Wilton Park conference earlier this year, which was about the protection of critical infrastructure in general. But one of the comments which was on the side of this conference pointed out that last year, last year, 2020 year, um, biggest threat or biggest most popular threat most commented in the world obviously was COVID but in 2021 it is ransomware so indeed that is important but now I would like to turn to Henri, uh, Henri Verdeer uh, who is uh, multi-purpose ambassador serves both cyber security that uh, Regina has uh, pointed out but also digital affairs and he's as I mentioned entrepreneur turned into the civil servant so uh, please share with us Henri your perspective on this topic Thank you very much, and yes, I will take your question in a more general sense. First, because I totally agree with my two colleagues and counterparts, so I would be boring if I say the same thing. And then because I think I, I was thinking when you did invite us, we are here in the IGF, so why do we speak about this specific relation? The IGF is a global forum for the multi-stakeholder governance of Internet from the United Nations. But I feel that this relation, our relation, is very important. N not just because, of course, our two continents did play a major role in the history of Internet. Everyone knows the role of the US, of course. Some, some people for forgive that in Europe, we are born quite every aspect of the open standards of Internet. TCP IP, the web, um, uh, ADSL, uh, Linux, uh, so we, we did create a very important part of this uh, history and this relation between two ecosystems can be very fundamental for the rest of the international organization. And just to share this, I, I will share with you a very simple idea. Yes, you did mention my professional life, so I was trained as a researcher and then I started three companies, and then I did lead the French open data policy, and then I was a state CTO, and now I'm a diplomat. I mention this because at each stage of this life, I had great cooperation with US counterparts, and together we did fight against the same adversary, and very often those adversaries were American or European. And my first message is that there is not one Europe-US relation. We have the history of the digital revolution that we are, that is being written before our eyes, is a multi-stakeholder, multi-actor story made by communities, companies, academics, states, regulation authorities, civil society organization. And they do interact nationally and internationally. And they exchange, cooperate, sometimes confront each other. And they, they have uh, many fruitful interactions. That's very important because, in my opinion, the first duty of the European-US relation is 
to try not to oversimplify th those relations through two simple geopolitical visions. We are two great ecosystems. We need to invent something, to invent how two very important e ecosystems could cooperate. Uh, we are more different than people usually think. For example, of course, in Europe, we, we like good regulation. But after the Facebook files, for example, maybe the work we did for the last four years could be important for everyone. Um, we can learn a lot from uh, the Silicon Valley, of course, or the Berkman Center, or the, I don't know, or, or DC even. And that's maybe my message uh, in this, during this round table. Uh, we could try to invent how two big, great ecosystems could interact. And if we succeed in this, we could enlarge this vision. It would be something useful for everyone, for the rest of the world, for every ecosystem in the world. So maybe my message is, uh, let's try to invent how two ecosystems can cooperate. Thank you, Henri. <clears throat> that is uh, also a very interesting angle from which you uh, describe this um, relation in cyber and digital. I would like now to ask uh, Krzysztof, who is representing the Polish Prime Minister's office, and in his daily work, he's uh, working on the economic issues, mostly on the economic issues in the framework of the European Union, and uh, this is his department which was uh, preparing the uh, Polish position on the uh, digital autonomy or strategic autonomy in larger in Poland. So in this context of this specific uh, uh, discussion, I would like to ask Krzysztof, who is online and joining us uh, online from Warsaw, to share his views and comments. Krzysztof, the floor is yours. Thank you, Tadeusz. Good evening to, to everyone and thank you for inviting me to this uh, panel to discuss uh, transatlantic cooperation. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, I would like to focus on uh, regulatory economic angle uh, as uh, digitalization brought uh, enormous opportunities uh, for businesses, uh, increased prosperity and uh, brand new products and services, but also brought uh, numerous challenges uh, that require our careful attention and action. Uh, and uh, these challenges uh, are visible with more clar clarity after analyzing particular cases uh, that appear uh, on both sides uh, of the Atlantic in the past years. <clears throat> they are all often high uh, in the media, high on the news, uh, data leaks, uh, anti-vaccine campaigns uh, and we are all confronted uh, with uh, uh, key questions uh, how to ensure uh, privacy protection how to develop standards uh, for access uh, and management of uh, industrial data uh, how to discourage potential abuses of uh, dominant position of uh, digital companies that uh, grew to significant uh, size uh, how to fight uh, disinformation and uh, how to secure basic uh, digital rights like freedom of speech. So the good news for, uh, for uh, our transatlantic cooperation is that we need to tackle similar challenges and that the starting point is uh, common uh, fundamental values. So we could credibly hope that the final regulatory outcomes will be not so far away. Uh, obviously, e European Union is relatively advanced in, uh, in addressing these challenges, often uh, boasts itself as a regulatory superpower, uh, but it's not because you want to protect access to, to, to the market, but it's rather the necessity to address all those challenges to secure broad support for digital transformation. And when I observe uh, debate across the Atlantic on digital, all those, all those issues uh, are also intensely debated. Uh, and there are already substantial regulation on federal or state level, uh, some of them very much aligned to what EU has done so far. Uh, but I believe my American colleagues could tell us more about how uh, the approaches evolve. 
So I'm convinced uh, uh, that uh, when the debate progresses, we observe even more convergent uh, solutions. Uh, we need to have in mind clear benefits uh, from regulatory um, cooperation. The less fragmented regulatory transatlantic space, the easier it will be for our, for our businesses to thrive. And the more aligned we are, the better chances to, to shape, to influence uh, global rules. But there are also obvious obstacles. Uh, yes, we do have competing economic interests, quite substantial asymmetry in the scale of digital companies uh, and different regulatory traditions. So there might be impression that uh, more burden or more adjustment uh, will be expected from US companies. Mm, and the second challenge is that uh, there is also uh, mm, quite uh, time consuming to find internal consensus within the EU to uh, how we should tackle these challenges. So it's a uh, work in progress and all member states have, have to be on board. It takes time, but I think it's manageable. Uh, we need to make sure that solutions to challenges are proportionate and provide level playing field. And we have some very encourages, encouraging examples. Uh, even in most difficult uh, issues like taxation, we were able to find satisfactory consensus. Uh, here, I mean OECD historical agreement that assure benefits for of uh, digital that benefits of digitalization will be distributed in a fairer way. This is very positive signal uh, that we were able to tackle tax base erosion in in effective way. I believe that similar extra effort is needed to, to reduce potential tensions while addressing key challenges uh, with regulations. Uh, and uh, that is why Poland uh, will support uh, an open version of EU digital sovereignty. Mm, indeed, we must strengthen our digital capacities, but we need to remain open for cooperation uh, and promote openness towards uh, like-minded countries. And we do hope that uh, TTC, uh, Trade and Technology Council, will be very instrumental to better understand our approaches to key issues uh, and we can make uh, good progress. Thank you. Thank you, Krzysztof. It was, I think, very um, good comments from your side because it shows that there are um, some challenges, but also that there are very good examples of this similar challenges. So coming from the similar sources, we already overcame some uh, in some fields. So um, there is a, a, um, actually space where we can work together. But <clears throat> hearing from the member states of the European Union, I would like to turn to the US uh, now, because uh, mm, we would like to see how all these opportunities and challenges, they how do they look like from the American perspective. And uh, I would like uh, Stephen to take the floor and share with us the view from uh, Washington. Stephen, please. Thank you, thank you. And uh, unfortunately, I am in Washington as opposed to in Katowice, I have to say. I was quite jealous watching all of you mull around on the stage talking to each other before this panel began, and I miss out uh, on that. But also congratulations to, to you, Tadus, for putting together a panel that really brings together uh, people who focus on the security and the economic sides uh, of this issue and putting them together, which I think already is a theme uh, that we've seen uh, as important that we have to understand that both of those issues need to be de dealt with at the same time as we look forward in the transatlantic relationship. Now, unfortunately, I'm gonna steal a line from Pierce uh, in terms of how good the framing is that you've given to this particular uh, session. I really do think it, it hit it absolutely on the mark. And what we have to think of is that in a world that is currently characterized by strategic competition, competition that is centered on competition in critical and emerging technologies, it's very true that the United States and the European Union share a positive vision of technology as a net force for good, supporting the flourishing of our citizens and people all over the world. 
I think that's a theme that uh, came out from all of the speakers uh, from the European Union. Um, but what uh, we sometimes need to understand is that we do have distinct regulatory approaches, and we need to make sure that these approaches are always complementary rather than creating barriers um, for our two systems uh, for us to achieve our fundamental objectives. What I would say is sort of what that really means is that uh, as we cooperate on strategic competition, we must also ensure that our approach to economic competition between us is complementary of the first effort. And I think that that is something that we are doing and we're beginning to do it really well over the last few months. Both the United States and Europe, as we recover and change from the ongoing pandemic, our transatlantic digital relationship is going to be critical to us building back better. Now here at the State Department, uh, we are focusing on working with European allies and partners to ensure that together we remain the world's innovative leaders and standards setters. And that this innovation is grounded in democratic values and delivers real benefits for our citizens. I believe my French colleagues spoke about the importance of the innovation that we see in the United States and in Europe. Now, Secretary Blinken has identified six pillars that are necessary for us to meet the needs of our citizens, both in the United States and in Europe, I would say, as we face down techno-authoritarian regimes and other related threats posed to our society. First, he said we have to reduce the national security risks posed by malicious cyber activities and emerging technologies. Two, we need to strengthen the leadership of the US and those sharing our values, like the European Union, in tech competition. Third, we have to defend an open, interoperable, reliable, and secure internet. Fourth, ensure that technical standards and norms for emerging technologies are of the highest quality, industry-led, bottoms up. Fifth, we have to make sure that these emerging technologies work for, democracy, for democracies, not against democratic interests. And six, promote cooperation among democratic partners, which I think is a theme here tonight as well. Now, discussing these pillars in this particular context naturally leads to a discussion of the US-EU Trade and Technology Council, which is an example of those pillars in, in, in action. And in fact, I'm very proud that I work with Pierce on one of the working groups in the TTC, cooperating on how it is that we can advance security and competition in ICT sector. Now, the US and EU Trade and Technology Council is an important forum to advance an affirmative values-based US-EU tech agenda. As the TTC's inaugural meeting in Pittsburgh in September, the US and the EU issued a joint statement that made commitments in the areas of global trade challenges, addressing non-market trade distorting practices, semiconductor supply chains, investment screening, export controls, artificial intelligence. When you add in the other issues that we have um, in the working groups, tech standards, climate and, uh, and clean technology, misuse of technology threatens securities, security and human rights. What you see is we have a very extensive agenda on both the promote and the protect side of technology issues. I think you could only have such a, a broad depth, a broad um, uh, focus of concentration in a relationship as close and as deep as that which we have with the European Union. Now, we are seeking closer alignment and cooperation on technology policies and regulations, as my Polish colleague has mentioned. Now, we, of course, do recognize that it is unrealistic and probably not even necessary to have total convergence in our approaches. But given that we share many of the same objectives, we should seek to understand the differences and work towards complementary, risk-based, innovation-friendly approaches to tech market regulation. Now, since we're here at the Internet Governance Forum, let me also say that broadly, I think the United States and the European Union need to preserve and defend the vision of an open net that is open, interoperable, secure, and reliable, and to ensure the development and deployment of sensitive emerging technologies are done in a way that strengthens our democracies and defends against authoritarian approaches. This also includes support for the multi-stakeholder system of governance. Now, the transatlantic relationship based on our commitment to shared values 
has brought us 75 years of peace and prosperity. The Biden administration is committed to not only continuing, but to revitalizing and raising the ambition of the transatlantic relationship. Think that together we can ensure that technology is used to promote our values and tackle the most pressing challenges from the pandemic to climate change. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you. That was very important to hear the voice from Washington, even though we would like to hear the voice of Washington here from Katowice, not from Washington. But I hope that next time we can make it here or somewhere else in physical presence. And uh, last, but uh, definitely not least, I would like to ask uh, Pierce uh, O'Donoghue, uh, the director representing uh, European Commission, on the perspective uh, from the European institution itself. Thank you very much and good afternoon. Well, uh, some of my best lines have been stolen indeed by, by Christoph and, and Stephen, but uh, I'm happy about that. Uh, uh, and also the, the European Commission um, being able to then to add in my perspective, because from what we've heard already from the panel, we do have to focus on what are the challenges in the relationship. But I would just start by saying, of course, what is the alternative if we were to allow those challenges to dictate the relationship or we were to giving up on the cooperation that is evident? And of course, that's unthinkable because uh, if we are here in the IGF with a community who work hard and believe in an open, trusted, secure internet. Uh, and we need to work to play our role in securing that on both sides of the Atlantic. Uh, and of course, with global partners who think the same way about it. And that is exactly what's happening. We've heard from the cyber diplomats uh, whose expertise I acknowledge in terms of the cooperation that is there. Uh, and of course, we are working together on securing the open internet. On the European Union side, as people know, we have done quite a lot recently in order to strengthen and adapt our policy to growing threats, but also to rapidly developing technology, uh, to take a more holistic approach, to working, of course, with the member states who are in the front line of all of this. There is a national security element that is undeniable. Uh, and we have more recently introduced a set of measures uh, under the EU cyber security strategy, which is part of our digital decade program. Now, I won't go into the details there, but clearly what we are seeking to achieve is resilience, technology sovereignty and leadership. And I will say a word about technology sovereignty in a moment. Um, but it's also building the operational capacity to actually fight against uh, cyber threats and cyber crime, to deter and, of course, to respond. But to do that, and here we get again into the area of global relations, we cannot create a splinter net. We cannot cut off the internet because we'd be cutting off ourselves, not the rest of the world. We have to have a global and open cyberspace that is trusted and secure. So we have to work with partners and assist partners in, in a neutral and helpful way that is suitable for their level of development. So that resilience is a key issue and you'll be seeing more from the Commission and our President announced uh, in September that we will be bringing forward a new European Cyber Resilience Act to complete the suite of measures that we have put place on, on cyber security. Now, there are good examples in this domain, but I'm not the expert here on the panel. And we've heard already from Eugen, for example, with regard to ransomware. That's one of the good examples of, of detailed cooperation where administrations and economic actors have worked together. But I would actually like also to, to talk about wider areas of cooperation and specifically uh, what Stephen has just referred to and what Christoph referred to, which is the Transatlantic, uh, the Trade and Technology Council where we are working on a series of detailed issues uh, around connectivity, around ICT and technological development, and seeking to improve relations. They weren't so good uh, in, in the recent past, and I recognize fully when Stephen says we have to look forward, and that's exactly where we're going. Because the TTC, as we call it, is a sign of transatlantic cooperation, and it does serve as a forum for us to work out some of the issues and th th that are really there. And I think this is the point that I would like to interject. When in Europe we talk about technological sovereignty, it is not to go it on our own. It is not to create silos 
or to create a fortress Europe. Simply that wouldn't work. We know it wouldn't work anyway, whatever about uh, if that were to be a realistic ambition. It is to ensure that in times of geopolitical strife or even cyber warfare, that Europe is able to continue to operate its internet, to be able to provide services to others who share the same uh, principles and to support other countries with similar um, vision, uh, which, which may be more vulnerable than we are in the European Union in case of a doomsday scenario with regard to the internet. But we don't want it to get there. Uh, what we do need to do is to recognise that there are other tendencies which can have a more, a less dramatic but an undermining effect on cooperation, but therefore also on the security and the future of this open trusted internet, and that is what has been mentioned, in particular the fact of competition, even at state level, but commercial competition, which exists, and when that competition is also sometimes typified on both sides as being an example of a political culture or a commercial culture of the other side, which is not acceptable to us. Uh, as is uh, stated in the in the vision statement for this uh, panel today, we need to be very careful about what we do and don't do. We are not going to try to solve those commercial tensions, nor in fact do we want to. We want to live in a competitive environment where the technology can develop and where the stakeholder community, particularly innovators, can actually help us to develop the next generation internet. What government and state on both sides needs to do is to ensure that the principles that we all espouse to are maintained and that we do not use the technical weapons available to either side to undermine this ecosystem which we have seen created. So in the transatlantic trade and technology discussions, but also in cyber and cyber security in general, we need other voices. We need the voices of reason and we need the expertise. And that is why we are discussing this here in the IGF, the multi-stakeholder community, the community of cyber experts, technical experts, but also of NGOs, privacy and security advocates, those who are working for diversity and inclusion in the internet, are critical to call out governments or governmental organizations, wherever they may be, including in the European Union, if there are abuses or if there are problems, if through, even with the best of intentions, through regulating elements of the internet, we are actually stifling free speech or stifling innovation. So that is why in this environment particular, in particular, we must have a, an ongoing discussion and we must ensure that the multi-stakeholder community, civil society and others are fully informed and involved in the discussions, in the TTC and in everything that we do in cyber. Thank you. Thank you, Piers. Um, uh, we have uh, a situation uh, of negotiations at this moment. Apparently, we are uh, we've been given only originally 45 minutes, but I believe having such uh, prominent speakers and important topics, we are in the process of negotiating with the United Nations organization that we can extend it a little bit more. Uh, so, uh, I don't know the results of the negotiations yet, so I will make a very quick uh, roundup of what we've had. Uh, and if we are given uh, 15 minutes more, then I will, s I will go with the second round of the questions. What I've heard here is um, a lot of different things from different perspectives, because this is really very large area of cooperation. Uh, that we are talking about, but definitely uh, everyone was saying, and Peace was very specific when you said, if we do not cooperate closely, what is the alternative? What is the alternative? And uh, several speakers uh, from both sides of Atlantic Ocean pointed out, we have the same values, we, we share the same values, we share the same norms that we work together for within the framework of the United Nations. In fact, next week most of us will meet each other in the inaugurational meeting of the open-ended working group in the first committee to further discuss the norms of uh, responsible state behavior and we will be working together for the benefit of all countries in the world. So. We have the same norms, we have the same values, we have very often common interests. 
And yes, we have competition. Stephen has pointed out this competition doesn't have to be destructive. It can be a competition which is helping each other. And that was also the voice from Poland. Krzysztof said co convergence is the way to go, maybe. Yeah, we have a different uh, regulatory traditions. In Europe, we like it, things a little bit more regulated. In the US, it's a different tradition. But eventually, I think on both sides of, uh, of, the, of the Atlantic Ocean, we start to think about the same things, protection of privacy, but also protection of the freedom of speech. It's a protection of norms that we live along with, whether it's outside of internet or inside the internet. So it seems like definitely we have a good reasons to continue to work together not only to the benefit of the European states and the United States of America or other partners, because this is transatlantic, but in fact we are talking about partners outside Europe, as Canada, Australia, other countries that we work with closely. And it seems like the, the, the benefits are obvious. Regina has pointed out the cybersecurity. I said at the very introduction, there is no development of digital economy or, or prosperity of humankind without cybersecurity. Because the humankind prosperity depends these days on development of innovative technologies which are based on digital technologies. And without them, if they're not safe and they're not secure, it will be a failure. And uh, we have all of us all over the world we have to make everything together that uh, the digital technologies digital world is safe so cyber security is a key element to provide that and we have had a good examples of cooperation within europe and america to uh, provide for the cyber security of digital technologies and we continue to do that we work together in the framework of global organizations like the united nations because we share the values uh, this is not our values, these are universal values that we are working for. So definitely, yes, we will be uh, looking and working together even if we have these uh, differences or sometimes uh, various perspectives from which we do think. Well, I have to ask an open question because I have no communication. Do we have more time that I can go with the second round of the question or we'll have to wrap up? That is the question to whoever is uh, behind the scenes and making this meeting possible. I see no answer, so why don't we try to, to continue? So if anyone would like to add, maybe Natalie, you wanted to add something? Certainly, and um, I was actually wondering what this clock in front of us was doing, counting down, and I was waiting for sort of a launch, or, but uh, it is just sort of the, the next phase of our discussion. Um, I wanted to add something and pick up on something that Henri said about the ecosystem, but also others um, who mentioned the, the role of multi-stakeholders. And I think really that um, as transatlantic community, we need to get better in truly walking the talk of multi-stakeholderism. And that especially goes for governments. Um, in order to deliver concrete results, um, including through already existing multi-stakeholder platforms, such as we are here at the IGF. Um, and I think all stakeholders are essential, and uh, Piers uh, just made a uh, eloquently gave a very good list, I think, of all the different roles. Um, but what I'm wondering is how can we, when I started to ask questions about who in the industry are actually the multi-stakeholders, what I found striking is that um, it's mainly big tech. And I think we need to do better in terms of involving the smaller companies, the small SMEs that are very innovative, have um, a great view on what um, actually hinders them in terms of innovation, can give great feedback on everything we think about as, uh, as governments, as regulators, 
and they can also uh, play a very important role in delivering new tech uh, that is indeed in line with democratic principles. And we have, for example, the OECD principles on human rights. And uh, I think we should use them a lot better um, and make them known and look at how perhaps bigger industry players, um, NGOs, uh, but also governments can play a role in making those um, uh, those principles better known and operationalizing them. Um, in addition, I think multi-stakeholders have a very important role in implementing the normative uh, framework as, that we have agreed um, within the UN. And I know that Henri was on a panel on the program of action. Um, that uh, that is that is crucial. Um, also, multi-stakeholders can play a role in verification. I mean, Regine talked about um, um, the diplomatic responses. And um, uh, by the way, verification is not attribution, but, but the technical community can clearly play a role in um, analyzing what has actually happened in a cyber incident and to what extent the normative framework was being respected or not. And last but not least, multi-stakeholders play a big role in capacity building um, in order to implement the normative framework also in um, our nations. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie. Um, I will give a chance maybe to take the floor to Liesel Franz from Washington, who is the Deputy Cyber Coordinator uh, in the State Department. Liesel, if you hear us, can you can you join in? Uh, yes, I hear you well. Can you hear me? Yep. Oh, great. Well, I'm glad you got a little bit of time and hello to everyone there. And similar to Stephen, I'm sorry not to be there in person. I guess the only thing that I, I would like to add is that, you know, for some time we have had a very strong um, engagement on the cyber issues that has led to, I think, in many ways, the successes that we've seen. We started a US-EU cyber uh, dialogue in 2014, um, and we continue that dialogue today, and I think that that has been a great foundation for making sure that the values, the principles, and the negotiations <laughs> that we have been in together have, have shown that we can stick together in very difficult um, kinds of times and uh, not let uh, those that would try to drive a wedge between the US and the EU um, be successful in that regard. So I know I've taken you a little bit off topic for the last the last few comments that were made and I totally agree with, with Natalie that the stakeholder community is, uh, is uh, valuable for all, many of these discussions. So I hope that the discussions this week will uh, will uh, serve much good fodder for that, um, uh, as well as next week for those that will be in New York, either in, uh, in person or virtually. So thank you for giving me a moment just to highlight one of the areas that we continue to have very strong uh, engagement and uh, um, while we're on this topic. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, well, we'll have to be really closing uh, now soon because we have other events coming uh, as a part of IGF and there will be in uh, live person-to-person uh, -person meetings which are indeed uh, a very important part of what we're doing here. And new te technologies allowed me to coordinate things between uh, Katowice and Washington and even Warsaw so it's quite a success. I just briefly touch upon what uh, Natalie mentioned. She mentioned OECE in the in as an import OECD, but I wanted to mention OECE, the, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, uh, where Poland is taking the chair, chair in office position as the 1st of January. And we, we, we just announced last month what will be the, our priorities in the cybersecurity cooperation there, that this will be enhancing the societal resilience based on enhancing the social awareness of threats coming from internet or from cyberspace wider and also improving the cyber uh, education and i'm mentioning it here because these are the very basic grounds of how we can build together 
the safe uh, future of the cyber world. And there's no boundaries and no, no limits to cooperation in these areas. This is the European organization, but 53 countries belong to it. And it's uh, standards that we set are global. We need globally to be aware of what opportunities and what challenges the cyberspace is offering us. And we need globally cooperate to make the cyberspace safer and more turned to the benefit of all countries all over the world and all people all over the world. And I believe personally, and I believe all my speakers today share this belief, that the cooperation between uh, Europe and America, the transatlantic cooperation, is an important part of this global effort that, uh, uh, that we need to undertake. And we want to thank you, uh, the IGF, we want to thank United Nations for giving us space to talk about this important element. And I thank you all the audience here physically uh, present in Katowice and all of those who are online for listening to us and uh, maybe uh, bringing some good messages out of this discussion today. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you very much.